Welcome to Life Verbs Podcast, an inner and personal development podcast designed to nourish and enhance your inner awareness of the inner self. I am Coach Zen, a quad certified life coach. No matter the intensity of what you are navigating, I am here in support of you. I support you in discovering solutions within yourself. And together, we create a playbook so that you can win in life and so that you can reshape and create the life that you desire. Because the reason why you are desiring that, the reason why that passion is burning deeply within you is because it's a part of your purpose. You have the pen and you are the creator of your life. Everyone, I am ecstatic today because I have one of my favorite authors here, Florence Ann Romano. She is also a philanthropist and a personal growth strategist. She is the author of the phenomenal book that I am obsessed with right now, literally. I literally have read it more than three times. I'm so obsessed with her book, Build Your Village, which is a guide to finding joy and community in every stage of life. Her book discusses strategies for connecting again and putting an end to friendship recession so that you can avert a friendship depression. Florence discusses the importance of a support system, the six type of villagers for a fully functioning village, their qualities and characteristics, how to identify potential villagers, how to foster the villager qualities within yourself, and so much more. Florence also has been featured on over 500, you all. That's right. I didn't stutter when I said that. You heard that number correctly. 500 national and local media outlets across the country, including ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, TV affiliates, and the Sherry Shepherd Show, which is actually where I discovered Florence. Florence, welcome to Life Verbs Podcast. Oh my gosh, what an introduction, what energy and light that you have. This is already my favorite part of the week. I can promise you that. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this from the moment we connected after the Sherry Show. Same here, same here, Florence. We are so ecstatic to have you today because your book literally... <laughs> When I started reading your book, I started having conversations with my friends. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. Talk about it. Find yes. some people. <laughs> yes, I was like, look, this is what I want. Like you say this in your book and I put out there, what, this is what I want as well as asking them, how can I support them? How do I show up in their life so that I continue to do so? And they were just like, oh my gosh. Zen, these are amazing questions to the point where we actually got together and had uh, dinner and we had a game night and we literally had the best laughs. I mean, our faces hurt so much from laughing so hard. And this is all due to your book because they started reading it as well. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall at that dinner. I mean, that, that I wish you would have recorded it. I could watch that. That is amazing. That is, that's the holy grail right there, Zen. That's what I could, could I ask for anything else? That's exactly what I want is you to be able to read the book and have these really rich and meaningful conversations. That means the world. 
Definitely, definitely. You know, Florence, I have so many questions for you today. And my first question is, I have questions from me and also from some of my listeners yes. as well. So my first question is, in today's society, it seems as though we've become more disconnected than ever. Right. How do you think this lack of connection has impacted us? And what are some ways to open up our hearts to combat the lonely feelings that come from isolation? You know, during COVID, I always said that we knew on a global level what it felt like to lose our people. You know, all of a sudden overnight, everybody was gone. The support systems were gone. And we were all isolating and you know, sheltering in place. And then all of a sudden, we needed to start going back to some normal season. And, you know, those yoga pants and the Netflix was a little bit more interesting than perhaps connecting with people in real life. And not only did we not know how to do it anymore, we didn't really want to do it anymore. And that started me thinking about why is connecting so difficult again? And I think a very common thread for us with relationships is effort and also rejection. And for some reason, we are a little more nervous. There's a little bit more trepidation inside of all of us regarding that effort that we need to put in in order to connect with people than also feeling like, I don't know if I'm going to necessarily be accepted. And the acceptance part of it, I think is funny because when you're younger, when you're a kid, making relationships is easier because you're on the playground, you're in school. It's just kind of low hanging fruit. Then you get older and getting into relationships, connecting with people is a little bit more difficult. And you're just not in those environments where it's built in again all the time. And we start to become a little bit more self-conscious about who we are and what we need. So this idea that we're kind of slipping into this friendship recession is because we're not, we're not anchored enough within ourselves right now to say that we're worth it. I'm worth going out there and asking people to form a relationship with me, to connect with me, to nourish me in some way, because we don't want to feel like, and this is the other big thing, the other big secret, we don't want to ask for help. We don't want to ask for it because we feel like that makes us weak in some sort of way if we need to ask for those relationships. And that's sad to me because if you're waking up and feeling like you're a little depleted, a little unfulfilled or less joyful or very lonely, perhaps, it's it should be something empowering for us to do, to go out there and say, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to bring people into my life because I'm worthy of that love. But we, can, we have a hard time doing that. I love what you just stated, Florence, because the false beliefs and the stories that we tell ourselves, such as I'm not worthy right. and feeling undeserving truly is a detriment to our well-being. Right. right. And it's us standing in our own way. Exactly. Exactly. You're standing in your own way. And I always say about the book, you know, I could give you this roadmap. I could give you all the directions to the village that, you know, you want. And because, you know, you hear people use that term all the time that, you know, you know, where's the village? What's the number to call? These people just show up at your door. What is it? And I can, I can help you do all of this. And that's my goal, obviously, is to do that. But uh, unless you're going to get in the car and drive there, these directions aren't going to mean anything. They're not going to mean anything. And we have to be our own solution too. And so that's also what I want people to understand is most of the time, you're not going to make a change unless you're really ready to do it. So you can sit there and say to me, people have said it to me before, you know, I'm lonely. I don't have the friends. I'm not, I don't have a social calendar that I really like. I feel like I don't have a purpose. And then we'll start talking about, well, what's going on in your life? And what are you doing about it? What have you been doing to try to fix it? 
And, you know, there's not really an answer there. They really are like, well, I'm really, you know, really not. All right. I, I just, oh, I don't know. It's so hard. I don't know what to do. Well, you know, that's the first problem. The first problem may be that you are not putting the effort in. You are not deciding that you want it bad enough to change. What would you say to the person who may be asking as they're listening to this, Florence, how do I get ready? Like yeah. I want it, but how do how do I get ready? Like, what does that look like? What is the first step? What can really activate that for me? I want people to look at their lives and again, the ecosystem that you've kind of built for yourself. We talk about these six villagers, uh, accepting, dependable, cheerleader, communicator, organizer, and healer. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about more about this then, but I just wanna set it up there. As you start thinking about who fits into those definitions without me even giving a definition myself to it, I'm sure you're automatically starting to do that. As you start looking at how your life currently exists, the current ecosystem, like I said, start figuring out where you feel like the holes are. Let me give an example. Okay, maybe it is that you can say, I have all six of these people in my life. They're there, but I'm still not feeling fulfilled. I'm still waking up feeling like I'm, I have this kind of, this, this, this void or this gap existing within me. Well, it could be then that the people that you've cast in these roles are not the right person or people for these roles. Maybe you need to people move the people around in the seats a bit. Maybe you're looking at someone as your dependable villager and they're they keep falling short. They keep coming up short. They keep disappointing you. Well, maybe that's because you're asking them to be someone they're not. Maybe that's not their strengths. And so you need to think, you know what? I need to figure out who this person is. You want to meet someone where they are, not where you want them to be. And a lot of the time figuring that out is going to help you shuffle the deck. It's going to help you move those villagers around and figure out where they actually belong, what seat they should be sitting in. Because maybe they are someone who should be in your village. Village. Maybe they're not someone you're just going to fire. They're just not where they are in order to be working to their strengths to st support you. That's the first place I would start, making sure you've actually cast these people in the right role. After you do that then and you're like, all right, I think I feel like everyone's sitting in the right seat now. Where now are the gaps? Do I not have a healer villager? And that's what I really need to work on. I need to work on seeking that person out. And also, what am I doing? How am I participating in other people's villages? Am I meeting people where they need me to meet them? Or am I putting uh, inappropriate, not inappropriate in like a bad way, or am I putting inappropriate expectations on somebody um, regarding how, not that they're showing up for you, how I'm showing up for them. And that giving that pause, thinking really about what could I be working on too to show up better for my friends in the villages that I'm in. Would you give an example of an inappropriate expectation? Yes. Uh, you know, I've had many, many relationships in my life, whether they're romantic or just friendships, where you look at a person and you think, gosh, why couldn't you understand that that's what I needed? Why, why, why did I have to tell you? And that always drives me crazy because I'm like, we're not mind readers. How am I supposed to know how to help you if you don't ask for it? And this was an example, an example in a, in a previous relationship of mine, and this was a romantic relationship, but he would always get upset that I wouldn't know that I should have shown up for him in the way that he needed me to. And, it, it, and then he had, a, he had children actually. Uh, and he would get mad at me for not supporting him enough with his kids where like he needed me to go with him when he would go shopping for their clothes that I didn't offer to go with him. And I'm like, well, why didn't you ask me to come with you instead of waiting for me to fail? 
you know, instead of later on telling me, you know, Florence Ann, the fact that you didn't offer to come shopping with me for their back to school clothes, you know, you didn't show up for me. You know, why couldn't you be there for me in that moment? I'm like, I, you didn't ask me to. I, I wasn't going to just impede myself on your life, you know, and feel like that 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 was an expectation of me that was needed. So that's a place where I think it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate for you just to wait for me to fail instead of just communicating me simply this. I've got to take the girls back to school shopping. This isn't like the, the most uh, natural thing for me to do as a single dad. Uh, I could really use your help if you can make the time to come. We'll do it around you know your schedule. That would have, that would have been simple. But he put an expectation on me and instead, then I felt like I let him down. I let his daughters down. I let myself down because I felt like I didn't show up for someone I loved. And then that became a really icky moment. And, and it could have been avoided simply by communication and simply by asking for what you need. Communication, you all, communication. What I'm hearing is communication is key because we're all guilty of that. Right. Well, we all have done that. Well, why didn't they? Why didn't they? Well, did you ask? Right. Did you communicate? Right. I right. love that, Florence. I love that. What side effects can arise when loneliness isn't addressed properly, especially in a society where there are messages that are being perpetuated? I was on, I think I was going through TikTok or Instagram, and I saw this reel talking about, I'm busy. You know, I don't need friends. Like it, it, it's it's perpetuating that same message of um, what do they call it, the no sleep life, or right. or right. whatever, or hashtag no sleep, or what have you. It's like right. one of those messages that just really aren't healthy to keep no. chanting and to keep living in that story. So, what side effects can arise when loneliness isn't addressed properly? I think we're seeing uh, in society today uh, a lot of the mental health and well-being side effects there, uh, and that this epidemic of loneliness is causing a lot more of that isolation, not because of, of COVID anymore. You are isolating yourself. Uh, and, and it's not about the quantities and of people that you have in your life. It's the quality of people that you have in your life. And it's not also about even being with those people every single day, you know, that they're in that, you know, uh, geographic proximity to you. Some of the closest relationships I have, they don't even live in my state. I probably only get to see them maybe if I'm lucky a couple or a few times a year, but they're the closest people in my life that, you know, we make time for each other. We make sure we text, we make sure we phone call or FaceTime and I get to see their kids or whatever it is. So this idea that, again, going back to, it's a weakness to ask for help, perpetuating this idea that I'm too busy for friends and I don't need anyone but myself, well, I actually think you're saying a mouthful there. It's there's something much deeper going on with those people that say, I don't have time for friends. It's them, I also think, feeling like, again, there is a rejection that they're worried about. But then also looking a little bit deeper into that, you saying you don't have time for friends means you are just all into yourself. And I, I, I don't understand how people don't take pause and think about other people and how they can be helpful. In my life, I will say then, it's, I don't know the meaning of life. I say this all the time. I have no idea what the meaning of life is, but I know what my meaning of life is. My meaning of life is to live a life in service of others. So... It doesn't mean that I'm not taking care of myself. I have to put that oxygen mask on myself first so I can take care of other people. But if you're sitting there telling me that you're too busy for friends, 
then that's telling me that you have no desire to show up for people, no desire to look outside of yourself. You're only concentrating on what serves you. And I don't know, that's not a person I wanna know. That's not a person I wanna be friends with because clearly everything there in that relationship is gonna be transactional or one-sided. And I don't want to be friends with that type of person either, Florence, because it's, no. it's a misalignment right. of how our natural state of being is. I always say if we were meant to not coexist with one another, to not have relationship of any kind, we would be completely content by ourselves. We wouldn't have family. We wouldn't have friends. We wouldn't have loving relationships. We right. wouldn't have any of that. Siblings, there would be no such thing as loneliness. So I right. love how you put that. Right. And um, I mean, I was born into an old fashioned Italian family, a multi-generational home. My grandparents lived with us. I mean, it was the best time ever. But I also understand that not everybody grew up in a household like mine. Not everybody was born into a family like mine. My first villagers were my immediate family. They were my cousins. You know, they were my first best friends. Um, so that's why I also want to challenge people to look at what your life is and realize that when you maybe feel out of control, because there's so many places then where we feel out of control, I always say, there is a place you can take control. There always is. No matter what's going on, there is a way to do that. And maybe you weren't born into that village that you wish you had. But now as an adult, you have the choice to actually create that for yourself. You can choose the people that become your family. You can have that as a real living, breathing organism, living, breathing village in your life if you make the right choices and you do the work to put yourself out there, make those relationships, find those people, and then tend to that garden. But again, you have to want it. But I don't want people to think that they're exempt from having this village that we're talking about if you weren't born into it, because that has nothing to do with it when, as you start to get older and start to own your life, I want to empower people to do that. I love that. Speaking of the village and the six villagers, I would love for you to dive deeper into each one. Now, you all, if you want the full deep dive, read the book. OK, <laughs> but Lawrence, if you can give us just a brief summary of each villager. When I saw this on the Sherry Shepherd show, I literally took a screenshot and I'm like, this is golden. This is, ah! this is phenomenal. <laughs> Sherry, I had a good time talking about it. I could see her thinking about it. Like, yes. I, say it, I could see her. So I always say you're going to cast these villagers kind of like you do uh, in a movie or a play. These are the main characters in your life. So let's start with the, the first one, accepting. This is who I would consider your non-judgmental villager. Think about a person that you've recently confided in or told a secret to. That's your accepting villager. It tends to be probably the most important one you start with, I would say, because everyone in life wants to be seen, heard, and understood. And this villager does a lot of that. So that's accepting. Dependable. This is your emergency contact. I always laugh that it's the person that you would call if you were stuck in a ditch somewhere, but no one answers their phone anymore now, Zen. So I don't know who you're calling to, you know, get you out of that ditch. Now, I'll tell you what, I am all of my friends' emergency contact because I always answer my phone. And I'm not only just that, I'm not just their emergency contact, I'm their kids for their school or their daycare. If they can't get a hold of their mom or dad, they call Aunt Lo. Uh, so I'm that dependable person for, for some people in life. But your emergency contact, not just you know if you're in a ditch somewhere, but it's someone that you know that is consistently there. That it's someone that it doesn't matter the time of day or how long it's been even since you've talked to them, that they're going to be able to be there for you. So that's dependable. Cheerleader, one of my favorite ones. So this is your hype person. If you're going through a transition in life, this is the person that's going to be there to be like, you can do this, cheer you on. Yes, not just during the exciting times, 
but also during the tough stuff too. When life gets a little icky, this person's going to be there to help say, I'm going to be able to not just walk next to you through it, but be able to make sure that you know that you're not alone in it. And some of these you're gonna see have a little cross-pollination too. But your cheerleader is the one that you know is always going to be just 100% sold out for you. So then your communicator. This person is kind of curious, even tempered. Think about a stove. You've got a pot on a stove that's boiling. They're always gonna turn the temperature down on the stove. They're not gonna turn it up. They're gonna put the lid on it. They're someone you can depend on that way to make sure that what's going on in life just kind of has that calm factor attached to it. Uh, so now organizer has a little bit of overlap here, but your organizer is someone I like to think of as decluttering both your heart and your home. It's the person that's able to bring that piece again to your life but also someone that you can delegate to that you know is gonna get the job done because it's no use delegating to someone if they're not actually gonna follow through. That's the only way you get peace of mind from, a dele from delegating is if you know that person's gonna do it. So that organizer is very important in that way. And then the last one, healer. This one I would say has a lot of different th threads perhaps of the other villagers, but there's something very specific about a healer. They are gonna walk next to you and through it with you, no matter what, whatever the it is in life. Sometimes that's the beautiful stuff and sometimes that's the really hard stuff, the really icky stuff, but they're your North Star. They're the one that does make you feel better, but also a very important caveat. They're not there to fix you or to fix the situation necessarily. They're there just to be next to you, be with you. One thing I always say to people, whenever I, I have um, a new uh, follower on Instagram, I always, people think that it's an automatic thing. I always send a, a message myself to whomever it is that's following along. And I always sign off that message by saying with you. And that's truly what I mean by this village is I am with you. And that healer villager is really the epitome of that is what it means to be with you through it. So those are kind of a snapshot of the six. I love that, <laughs> especially with the healer, your North Star. North Star. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And I feel that all of them are just so necessary in your life. But I feel that so many people do not have that healer friend. Right. They don't. They don't. And, you know, I think it's, I always say to people, um, instead of for like your New Year's resolution, instead of you being like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds or I'm going to be in the gym seven days a week or I'm going to give up, you know, sweets. Wouldn't it be great if we decided that a New Year's resolution was going to be you picking one of those villagers and say, okay, I want to be better at this because I think I have I have the propensity to do it. I have the capacity to do this. I'm going to work on being a healer villager and I'm going to work on that within myself, but I'm also going to spend time looking at who can I identify in my life as that person and who also can I go seek out and what am I going to do? How am I going to seek out that person? How do I go about finding them? Because that's where people get stuck too. It's like, all right, I don't have a healer, but how do I go get that healer for? And say, well, that's what the book is about, is about giving you those steps to do it. But what I will say is it's about figuring out who you are first, because that's where you're going to be led to these people. You have to have shared values. You have to have... Uh, similar interests, similar passions. Doesn't mean there isn't diversity. Doesn't mean you're not picking people that are different from you in all sorts of ways that challenge you. But you have to know thyself first. I always say that. This work in this book is about figuring out who you are just as much as figuring out who you need. Yes, definitely. Oh my gosh, I love that, Florence. I just... You all, I trust you're taking notes. And if not, get your notebook out now and re-listen to, to this podcast because literally, Florence, you are just, 
giving so many gems here. I absolutely love it. In your book, Build Your Village, you stated as a nanny, you studied the village of mothers. And that was just so fascinating to me and how they achieve balance in their life. Right. And in asking for, you said they did that by asking for help. Right. And yeah. when they ask for help, you begin to see them thriving right. in right. their lives. And then you provided steps in the book for mothers on how to create an environment of love and support in their lives. You suggest that mastering these principles can help them raise families, launch businesses, and achieve balance amidst the changes life throws their way. Right. For those women who may find this easier said than done, what suggestions would you give to moms that are feeling the pressure to do it all, be, I'm every woman, it's all in me. (laughs) (laughs) Right? (laughs) That's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, I feel like society, especially social media, makes us feel like we are inferior. We are not meeting the mark. We're totally failing because you look at all these people on social media showing that highlight reel and it looks like they're doing everything perfectly. And you're comparing yourself on this subconscious level to them. You are comparing yourself and you go to sleep at night feeling like you are the worst mom ever because that mom put up better decorations than i did i barely got a pumpkin par- carved for thing you know for, for thanks i can't even think of the holiday halloween this year you know i barely got you know pumpkins carved and i saw the house across the street she had a whole thing going on it was like a farm uh, you know over there and i totally let my kids down and there was nothing magical about the holidays because you're comparing yourself to everyone and That's also, I think, a very um, conscious choice that we need to make, not only as mothers, but just human beings, especially women, that we're not going around and comparing ourselves all the time to everybody. And sometimes that means you need to put that phone away and stop that, that doom scrolling, as they would say. But also, if you are one of these moms that feels like you have to do everything yourself in order to prove to yourself that you can do it you are doing yourself self such an incredible disservice because we're not supposed to be doing life ourselves we are supposed to be connecting with other human beings we are supposed to be asking for help and letting love in and speaking of letting that love in if you're doing it all yourself not only are you not allowing yourself to be loved and supported you also are taking that benefit away from your children And I saw this as a nanny very often where moms felt so competitive sometimes with even me as the nanny because their children loved me. And they would feel bad when I would leave at the end of the day and they would say, no, no, don't leave, you know, and make the mom feel bad. And I understand how that could make you feel in that moment. And I would always always pull the moms aside and I go, listen, they're going to be totally fine in two seconds after I walk out that door and they're going to be so happy to be spending time with mom. They're going to forget that I left. I said, you know, but what you need to look at a nanny, you need to look at a nanny in this way, kind of like a godparent or an aunt or an uncle, someone that's in your child's life that in any other circumstances in your family, you would want that child to connect with your family members. You'd want them to feel loved by other people than just the parents. And so if you can reframe that for yourself in your life, reframe it for you, the parent, saying, I deserve love. I deserve that support. I also want to be able to give that to my children, too. I want them to know as much love as they possibly can have in their life. I want them to know that they can turn to other people, too, and ask for help, that they can be supported, that they know that they're not alone in this life. You need to model this behavior for your children. So if you're having a hard time accepting it for yourself, then maybe start thinking about what it is that you want your children to have in their life. And maybe it will start to make you accept that more as well. It sounds like a nanny is a part of your village. Yes. Instead of looking 
at the nanny as separate, that nanny is actually a very essential part of your village. Just like you said, I love how you phrase, think of a nanny as a godparent, yeah. as an auntie. I mean, you say that to your friends. I know my friends who have kids are like, oh, that's auntie's in, that's auntie's in. Yeah. Why would it not be? And the nanny is with your children more than I. <laughs> right, right. And they, they are influential. That's also why picking the nanny is important. They're supposed to be an extension of your eyes, ears, and heart. I always say it, extension of the parents' eyes, ears, and heart. And you want to populate your child's village too with people that are going to be great examples for them. Uh, and if you can take the competition thread out of it for yourself, then that's going to open up a whole new world for you. But when you allow your child to form relationships with other people, those are going to become teachers in their lives. The same way that we Zen pick our friends, we're picking the good ones, picking good friends, they should be teaching us a lot of lessons too. I always say inside of me, I feel like is a mosaic. And I take a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person, and it becomes this mosaic inside of me that when I live my life, however I'm living my life, whatever circumstances or situations come up, I reach inside of me into that mosaic and I take that little piece out and I think that's what I learned from that person. That's how I know how to navigate this situation a little bit better maybe because that person modeled something for me that was important, that I wanted to make sure became part of me, became part of my fiber. Again, I want you to do this work for yourself so that you can then go out into the world and hopefully have that effect on other people. And it becomes this beautiful circle, this beautiful symbiotic relationship where it's this this reciprocation and this give and take and this constant learning and we're constant students of one another because we're working on ourselves to become our best self so that when we are doing this energy exchange like we are today, Zen, I'm going to take so much away just from you and know that you're going to become part of that mosaic and because you taught me so many things today. One thing I can say right now is you're so good at making the person you're talking to feel like they're treasured, that they feel like they're, they're, they're important. And that to me is absolutely enormous when it comes to me then figuring out how I am going to show up for a person because Zen showed me how I want to improve upon myself because it was, it was the example was provided for me. But again, the only way that's going to happen is through connection. Definitely, and vice versa. I'm learning so much as well from you. This is just a wealth of information.